welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today in our postmodern conservative series, I am joined by one of the polymaths I admire most, David P. Goldman, who writes the Spengler column for the Asian Times, and who has a new book out on China. You Will Be Assimilated is the title. Usually, David and I talk about classical music or Spanish poetry or philosophy and religion, but today we turn to politics and technology. I interviewed him in what is the first in a series of conversation on China and America confronting each other. This is of course not merely a theoretical matter, we take the side of America, we wish for American freedom to prosper, but to do so we need to understand what we are dealing with and that requires detachment. This attitude used to be called seriousness, and David Goldman is the best example of it I can offer. So without further ado, on to the interview. Hello, David Goldman. When I asked to interview you, my main notion was that China can help Americans become serious. Competition can wake people up. Adversity can also make certain internal conflicts less urgent, less sharp. Well... We have never had a competitor as large and as aggressive and as competent as China, if you put all these three things together. Japan in World War II had less than half of our population, maybe a quarter of our GDP. China's GDP is already larger than ours in purchasing power parity terms and will be larger than ours by the end of the decade in U.S. dollar terms. It also has four and a half times our population. The Russian economy during the Cold War was always a wounded beast. The Russians could afford guns but not butter. They spent, by many estimates, up to 25% of gross domestic product on their military, and their military was, in some respects, quite good. But when we move to microchip-based weapons, to the digital age, we left them behind completely. When that became apparent to the Russians, particularly after the 1982 air war in the Bekaa Valley, where the Israelis wiped out the core of the Syrian Air Force with no casualties, they were quite clear that they were going to lose the Cold War. They would lose a conventional war, and they didn't want to fight a nuclear war. China is an entirely different order. China challenges us on several levels. First of all, it is a power roughly comparable to us technologically, militarily, and economically. Now, technologically, we're still ahead of them in many key areas, but they're catching up and even leapfrogging us in others. It's very hard to say exactly where we stand, but we don't have an unambiguous lead. We've been used to having a technological lead on the rest of the world since we defeated Germany in 1945. It's been a very long time since we've had anyone to compete with us. So in terms of population size and ambition and technology, China is a unique opponent. The United States cannot count anymore on, well, having the flexibility to make one stupid error after another and eventually get it right. Winston Churchill famously said that the United States always does the right thing after exhausting the alternatives. We don't have as much room for error simply because of these factors I mentioned. That's the first thing. The second thing is China is a 5,000-year-old civilization. Its language in rudiments is more than 3,000 years old. Its system of governance, which is based on a centralized regime that invests massively in infrastructure and is governed by a managerial elite, has been in place in the current form for 2,500 years, perhaps, and in at least in some respects for 5,000 years. China keeps collapsing, but it keeps reconstituting itself. If you look at all the civilizations of the ancient world, Sumerians and Babylonians, Romans and Greeks and so forth, there's really nothing left of them but culture, language, and tourist sites. Uh, But China's civilization is still essentially what it was. The most important water management project in Sichuan province is exactly what it was in 300 BCE when uh, an engineer named Li Bang, working for the first Chinese emperor, Qin Shi Huang, built it. It's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's full of tourists, but it still accomplishes exactly what it did 2,300 years ago, which is to irrigate 10,000 square miles of the Sichuan Plain, which is the breadbasket of China. We tend to think that American Republican democracy embodies the natural way of doing things. The Declaration of Independence appeals to nature and nature's God. 
Lincoln, in his address to the New Jersey legislature right before the 1860 election, when he talked about an almost chosen people, talked about things that we would do which would be of importance to all mankind in all ages. But we're a relatively young country, and we're getting serious competition from a 5,000-year-old civilization, which is radically different from ours, not only radically different, in many respects, repugnant to us. And I say that deliberately, although I have great respect for the Chinese, I find many aspects of their civilization, and particularly one element, repugnant, namely the absence of a sense of the sanctity of the individual. That simply does not exist in a Chinese context. For thousands of years, the Chinese have been willing to sacrifice very large numbers of people to the common good, and that continues. It is something of a shock to us that we are in serious competition with a civilization that rejects the fundamental principles of America's founding. It is disturbing to us, and I think it should be, that there's at least a significant possibility that Chinese civilization might be the victor in the world, might become the most prestigious and powerful form of civilization, which would in many ways undermine the prestige of American democracy, which we believe is in a certain sense the right way to do things for everybody. Now, we've had a very bad experience trying to imminentize the eschaton, so to speak, by exporting democracy to places like Iraq and Afghanistan. But still, in our heart of hearts, in the Judeo-Christian view of things, we think that these principles are in some way applicable to all of humanity, but they don't seem to be applicable to China. So it's a double shock. It's, it's a cultural shock, and it's a strategic challenge. And the most dire and pressing strategic challenge that we probably ever had in our history. Yeah, I think maybe this is the place to start. It is very hard for Americans to comprehend just how different China is. Partly that's because, as you say, there is something positively ancient about China, this despotic model of government and the discovery itself that despotism is based on technology. If you can irrigate and if you can control a territory, that is how you run things. The plains of great rivers in great antiquity fostered great civilizations where in every case, technology and great despotism went hand in hand. But this would seem to be outdated. It would seem that nowadays you go to the movies or you play a computer game if you want to see ancient empires in all their colorful obsolescence. But we have one in front of us now, in our faces. The same principles of technological despotism seem to be perfectly compatible with the greatest advances in technology. And indeed, it seems like there's no belief of foundational character that is shared between America and China. And so it's hard to even begin to grasp how could something so old return and be so powerful now. Yeah, well, there are very mixed views about this. When uh, Professor James Hankins of Harvard reviewed my book, you will be assimilated for Claremont Review of Books. He took me to task for exaggerating differences and made an argument, which is popular in some places, that Confucianism could be equated in some way to Stoicism as a philosophy. I really disagree with that quite strongly. I don't mean to sound like a Marxist or an economic determinist, but if you consider ancient China, the riparian agriculture of ancient China historically produced a caloric content per acre of cultivated land five to ten times that of dry agriculture in either the Middle East or Europe. The great blessing of China is to have 10,000 miles of the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, not even counting their tributaries. The curse of China is having 10,000 miles of the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, because although China had a greater population density and more wealth than anyone else, the rivers flooded with regularity, and then you'd lose 10 or 20 or 30 percent of your population. So the collective effort required to mitigate against that, and we know that that effort began in a large scale no later than 5,000 years ago from archaeological studies required a very large centralized state. There's a whole school of sort of economic determinism which tries to derive the Chinese political system from geographic conditions. It's exaggerated, but not entirely wrong. By contrast, if you look at Greece and Israel in ancient times, their land was best suited for small holding agriculture, where you had terraced farms where an individual householder would make sure that the topsoil was preserved and sat, as the Bible said, under his own vine and fig tree. 
without stressing economic determinism, the cultivation of the individual through the smallholding farmer was natural, as it were, to both Greece and Israel. When Moses took us from the desert into the land of Israel, he said the land that you're going into is very different from the one you came from. Uh, you don't irrigate by pumps out of a river. You rely on rain-fed agriculture. Although I believe that the origin of both ancient Greece and Israel is, first of all, spiritual and intellectual and not geographic, Moses himself emphasized the difference in geography. China and the United States both solve a problem, which is a common problem in radically different ways, which is how do you have a very large geographic entity which assimilates large numbers of people of different languages and ethnicities into a unified political state? In the case of China, the ethnicities, as it were, are preserved in amber. There's still 200 languages spoken in China, 80 major ethnic groups. Mandarin, which is simply the Beijing court dialect, is spoken conversationally by less than a quarter of the Chinese population. In other words, if people sit down for a beer, a very small minority of Chinese will speak Mandarin, although most Chinese understand some Mandarin. If you go out to Sichuan, where Sichuanese is an entirely different language than Mandarin, if you speak Mandarin, you made it a translate, not to mention in Wangzhou, Canton. Cantonese is an entirely different language than Mandarin. China is united by an imperial system of characters, of ideograms, and the process of becoming Chinese is to sit down when you're six years old with a brush and a pot of ink and spend three or four hours a day learning how to draw 2,000 characters, which will take you until you're about 11 years old. And with that, you can read a newspaper. With about 600 characters, you can read most of the Chinese classics. To be really literate, you'd have to know 10,000 characters. So every Chinese has a dual identity. You have an imperial identity, which is written, and you have an ethnic identity, which is oral. Chinese mothers do not sing their babies to sleep in Chinese. It's in Cantonese or Sichuanese or Pukanese or one of the many other dialects. This is changing to some extent through migration, centralization, national educational system, but it's changing much more slowly than you could expect. America, of course, has its motto, a pluribus una. Americans come here, the second generation forgets the language of the first generation. American Hispanics in the second generation speak a ghastly thing called Spanglish, and in the third generation speak very little Spanish at all. That's the fate of all the immigrants here. We assimilate people. This is fundamentally, in my view, and I say this as a Jew, this is a Christian nation, not just in veneer, but in fundamental principle, because to become an American is, in a sense, to be born again. It's to develop a new identity. And until very recently, we have been incredibly successful at assimilating immigrants and making them patriotic Americans and incorporating them into a unified national culture. And we have a unified national, we had until recently, at least, a unified national culture for what it's worth, which, you know, everybody, um, in a sense, was impregnated with. Now, China still, its great strength is always its great weakness. Its great strength is the ability to assimilate many different ethnicities, nationalities, languages into an imperial framework. And the glue that holds it together is twofold. It's the infrastructure that is a common good. If you have a flood on the Yellow River, as you did 5,000 years ago due to an earthquake, which for eight months backed up the river, and then that natural dam breaks, you'll have a flood thousands of miles down the river. So there's an incentive for everyone to be involved in the infrastructure. And the other glue is the imperial Mandarin system, which aligns the interest of the cleverest and most enterprising young men, the now young men and women of the Chinese empire, by offering them the opportunity to become Mandarins, to join the elite by virtue of standardized exams. And that brings people of humble origins into the elite regularly. It's comparable in a sense to the church in the Middle Ages as opposed to the nobility, which would be a talent pool for people of humble origin. You know, up through Pacioli, you had popes of very humble origin, Wojtyla, Ratzinger. These people were not you know, from the elite. They came from the peasantry, the lower middle class. And the Chinese elite has been very successful in unifying the country's interest in that respect. The great weakness of China is that it still has embedded it in all of these differences. So when the center becomes weak because of famine, epidemic, foreign invasion, 
natural disaster, it tends to split apart into warring regions. You have periods of warlordism with catastrophic humanitarian consequences. And of course, the warlordism of the 1920s and 1930s invited the Japanese invasion and the Civil War of the 1940s. And that followed the Civil War of the Taiping Rebellion of the 19th century, which killed anywhere from 20 to 100 million people. No one knows how many. I mean, the number of people killed in wars and died in famines between the Opium Wars and the Great Leap Forward is in the hundreds of millions. China's capacity for tragic dissolution is something which is deeply stamped on the Chinese character. That's why I don't think that the Chinese people really are interested in any kind of political experimentation now. Cannibalism is a living memory in China from the Great Leap Forward. America's great strength is that it's a Christian nation. It converts people in a Christian fashion. It makes them into Americans. You become an American by choosing to be an American. That's also its great weakness. Just as China's strength is its weakness, our strength is our weakness, because when our mechanism for conversion is perverted into a different kind of objective, we go completely stark raving crazy. This is a point very well made by my friend Joshua Mitchell in his book, An American Awakening. It was made by Joseph Bottom, also in his book, An Anxious Age. The woke political correctness our cultural revolution, as it were, in America, in a sense, has the same phenomenology of Christian conversion, except with secular ends, with political correctness substituting for salvation. So the same passion and the same sense of self-invention that availed us so well when we built this country can turn into something extremely dangerous and destructive. Yeah. China is so different from us that my friend Francesco Sisci, the S-I-S-C-I, Italian sinologist resident in Beijing, tells audiences when he lectures about China, imagine that you're on Mars. And that's why for the title of my book, I chose a meme from science fiction from uh, Star Trek rather than any category of conventional political science. Yeah, so in America, people can get impatient of that great achievement, that great transformation that everybody longs for. The national restlessness can lead to a kind of sudden and, in a way, uncontrollable national protest against the limits of the human condition, not just of current government practice or various failures of society. That is, people sign up for the American promise and can get incredibly bellicose if they lose hope in it. That terrible desire to be American can also turn into a desire for revenge if dissatisfied. Indeed, this seems to have weakened America terribly in the last generation. And now it, there's a question whether Americans can confront this incredibly different challenge since there is no equivalent of this restlessness in China. As you say, the problem the Chinese face is that they know they strike a kind of devil's bargain. They obey, but if the authority should collapse or weaken enough, there is nothing left. There's absolutely no backstop, and the entire country can descend into terrible horrors. The distinction between an incredibly proud and incredibly efficient system and death by violence and especially starvation, as you say, is very narrow, strangely enough. The American idea since 1945, at least, that we can make our American problem somebody else's American problem too. We can democratize other nations and then they will share not only in our strength or in capitalist prosperity, they will share our weaknesses. They will no longer be warlike. That idea seems to be faltering on the fact that there is absolutely no way for American policy or American ideas of policy to create a rift between the Chinese people and the Chinese ruling class, since the Chinese will obey it. I think that's the case. I think that Secretary of State Pompeo and his advisors made a catastrophic error when they believed that American policy could weaken the present Chinese regime. They listened to too many exiles, to too many of the losers in China's various civil wars. I think the fact is that the Chinese have had enough political experiments for quite some time. In the case of the United States, the great difficulty in Christianity is Augustine's problem of the city of man and the city of God. One tends to confuse this. In the best of American culture, we know how to keep these separate. I wrote an essay some years ago on American culture in which I emphasized the incompleted journey as a central theme of American culture. 
the American hero is always a pilgrim of sorts, as Mark Twain says ex almost explicitly in Huckleberry Finn, based on Bunyan's Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, who will never find the heavenly city on earth. It's always a point at infinity on the horizon. That's why Huck Finn, at the end of the novel, can only start again. He's got to start another journey. Every cowboy who rode into the sunset, every private detective who went off to take another case, is an avatar of Bunyan's Pilgrim in that respect. The problem is, we want heaven to be on earth, and it's hard to have the patience. So in the Civil War, we mobilized people with an apocalyptic vision of social transformation. I mean, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which is our national poem, begins with a quotation or a paraphrase of Isaiah. The Grapes of Wrath is a paraphrase from Isaiah 51. I can't remember the precise verse. Who comes from Edom with his garments stained with blood? It is I, saith the Lord, I've been trapped in the nations in a wine vat. How else do you get half a million Northerners to sacrifice their lives to free the slaves? Julia Ward Howe wrote about Jesus, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. And out of the Civil War, we get the social gospel and the attempt to turn Christianity into social work with Rauch and Bush and liberal Christianity. Liberal Christianity replaces the evangelical or Calvinist Christianity, which was the foundation of America before that, of the Methodists before that. In my generation, with the victory in World War II, we were going to transform the world, the United Nations, and make the world democratic and do all these wonderful things, get rid of colonialism. And then we had the Vietnam War, where our ideals ran up against a very different kind of reality, and we ended up doing some very nasty things as a matter of raison d'etat. So my generation revolted against that. In this generation, we have social problems which seem intractable, not just for minorities, but for a large part of the white working class. And in one way or the other, with either the woke critical race theory approach on one side or certain extreme kinds of populism on the other, we have a rebellion against the notion that the United States is a viable entity to begin with. And then in the midst of this, in one of our, certainly one of our worst internal crises, I don't know if you can call today's, people talk about a civil war, but we don't have half a million people being killed in the battlefields. It certainly is a crisis. We confront China. And what that means practically is that our flexibility to paper over our problems may shrink drastically. The United States has been living on foreign credit for a long time. Our net foreign asset position is $13 trillion. That's half a year's GDP, more than half a year's GDP. Now, that's our net borrowing from the rest of the world. And right now, we're running a trade deficit of nearly a trillion dollars a year. We keep adding to that. The $13 trillion or $14 trillion of negative net foreign asset position is basically our collective balance payments deficit over the last 30 years. So we've been living off other people's labor to a great extent because other people want a share in the American economy. People want stocks and real estate and bonds and so forth. They want to be part of us because we've had the great technology companies. We created the digital revolution. We have the best form of governance. So we're both a promise of future growth and political security. That's why the rest of the world has given us this 13 or $14 trillion. But if China becomes technologically more advanced, and if the great companies of the future aren't Microsoft and Google, but rather Tencent and Huawei and Alibaba, or whoever they turn out to be, then we will be unable to continue to borrow at extremely low interest rates or simply by selling stock uh, in American companies. Uh, we'll have to borrow very high interest rates. So all of a sudden, we'll look like you know, Brazil or Mexico or India, which have a great deal of constraints. And that means exactly the point where very large numbers of our people are dependent on the federal government. Well, certainly more than a quarter of all personal income now comes from transfer payments. And the Biden administration wants to increase that substantially. Exactly the point where the expectations of large numbers of Americans involve getting more money from the government. Our ability to get money cheaply from the rest of the world will shrink, perhaps drastically and perhaps suddenly. Now, in principle, you could say, isn't it great that the Chinese are developing technology? We can use that technology, too. Well, in some cases, absolutely. I mean, if China, hypothetically, were to have developed a vaccine against COVID-19 and we didn't, then we'd benefit. 
it's certainly the case that in theory, if we were to use Huawei's 5G boxes to build out 5G, we'd do it quicker and faster than if we tried to reinvent the wheel ourselves. There's a security issue there, which is a whole other can of worms. So there's certainly some Chinese technologies which are in principle good for us. But if China develops the network effects, the natural monopolies that become the magnet for the world's capital over the next 10 years, we will be a lot poorer. And there are two ways you can respond to that. One is to say, well, let's try to stop China from developing. And that's essentially what the Trump administration did. And the Biden administration tentatively appears committed to continuing. Let's not let them have certain technologies. Let's stop them from buying high-end uh, computer chips and so forth. The other is let us leapfrog. Them. Let's try to develop much faster ourselves. Now, it's certainly true that the Trump administration's technology controls in China have had a mixed impact. It certainly hurt China to some extent though a great deal less than I think that the Trump administration expected them to for the five to 10 year horizon. I do not believe that these controls will be effective simply because never in all of history has an established power managed to fend off competition from a challenger by controlling the flow of technology, particularly when the challenger has vast resources of human capital. For better or worse, we trained an entire generation of Chinese scientific and engineering faculty. Chinese universities are now, for the most part, at par with American universities, at least among the top tier in most engineering computer science applications. China now graduates seven times as many STEM bachelors as we do per year, and most of them are pretty good. 20 years ago, when the educational system was still suffering from the depredation of the Cultural Revolution, Chinese universities were diploma mills, but now the graduates they're getting are very competent. So with that amount of human capital, whatever we do, they'll figure out how to do it because they've got more than enough smart people. We can stop them, for example, from buying high-end chips from Taiwan, which we have on the grounds that those chips are manufactured in part with American machines and American intellectual property. But we can't stop the Chinese from hiring as many Taiwanese chip fabrication engineers as they want to and building plants in China. So five to 10 years, they will catch up. I don't believe technology restrictions work. I think we need a real wake-up call, a wake-up call like we had when Sputnik went up and they put the Russians into space before we did. That called forth a gigantic national effort and a change in mood. Great movie called... Um, well, it's based on a book called The Rocketeers about kids in West Virginia who were studying rocketry, started a rocket club. I forget the name. I think the movie is called October Sky. October Sky. Yeah, fantastic movie. I was a kid then, younger than those kids, but I remember how proud the family was that one of our cousins got accepted into MIT. That was a time when engineers got the girls. It was cool to be an engineer. The idea of going into space captivated the imagination. What we lack now is not just enough students signing up for engineering or enough qualified math teachers in high school. We lack a sense of national purpose and vision that trickles down to ordinary people and motivates them to do things that they might not have believed they could have done. Yeah, it does seem like America now needs this wake-up call because it is still true, as uh, you were quoting Churchill, that America has tried a bunch of different things to impress the Chinese or to convert the Chinese or to co-opt them. And none of it has worked and none of it is likely to work since America is looking ever less impressive to Americans themselves, never mind anybody else. And so instead of thinking that the world will be like America, it's a deep question, will America be like America? Perhaps if we want to get a new technological leap forward, it's important to figure out what's useful in technology. We can find some parallels that don't yet add up, but surely we can say that like engineers were once, software engineers are now. Software engineering isn't enough, as you were saying. If you can't be at the top of the semiconductor manufacturing industry, then what exactly are you going to achieve? It is not possible technologically, it would seem, to compete without that. And America is no good at it. Indeed, America is being humiliated since Intel, once a shining star in the global industrial constellation, is now a national embarrassment. It has to invest far more than they're saying they will and somehow put in years of work to, well, catch up to Taiwan, not get ahead. We'll see about getting ahead in another five years.
the software isn't enough. Hardware is necessary. Getting to hardware does require belief that these things will do something good, that it will achieve something for America that is worth doing. And that seems very, very hard to get people to believe now. America is dreaming software dreams at the level of engineering. And that's America is not going to be better off because of Facebook or Facebook plus Instagram or Facebook plus Instagram plus whatever they're buying. This is this is, bre- this is bread and circuses. The people making the big money are making it an entertainment. Apple's iPhone was technologically inferior to the BlackBerry when it came out. Until you know the middle of the 2015s, I insisted on carrying a BlackBerry for work because it was more reliable, had a much better phone. As a work instrument, the iPhone was pretty useless, but the iPhone gave you games, movies, and all kinds of other things that BlackBerry didn't. There are so many things we have to do that is daunting, but I think it really comes down to having a sense of unified national purpose, which reverberates through corporations, through schools, through social organizations, and so forth. You want people to aspire to become math teachers, to aspire to become engineers. You want corporations to aspire to go back to manufacturing. Because America had virtually unlimited capacity to borrow from the rest of the world, starting in the 1960s, U.S. tech companies came to an important decision in the early 2000s. In the late 1990s, we were building hardware. Venture capitalists were investing in hardware. We were building telecommunications equipment, computer equipment, and so forth. We got into a spot of overcapacity with the tech bubble of the late 1990s. And at that point, the most successful tech companies decided that they were much better off concentrating on software and letting Asia produce the hardware. Asia was just coming online and able to produce the hardware. Michael Dell didn't have to assemble laptops in his dorm room. He could order them from Taiwan or the mainland or from Korea. Back then, you know, Samsung was making a lot of money selling laptops. Software has a great advantage. The marginal cost of adding a customer is zero. That's just one more person going on the website and paying for the software with a credit card and downloading it. The marginal cost of adding a customer in hardware is real. I mean, you have to actually add plant equipment, raw materials, and labor. So the rates of return that you had on American tech companies were spectacular, unique in market history. And that created a self-perpetuating elite over the last 20 years, which made more money than anyone else ever had, with the premise that hardware was dirty. In the early 2000s, I was working at uh, Credit Suisse. I was managing a credit research team. And one of the most prominent Republican economists associated with the Reagan administration, whose name I won't mention because he's a friend and it would embarrass him, came and gave us a talk and said, there's no reason for the U.S. to ever manufacture anything again. That's dirty. Let other people do the dirty work. We'll just do the design. And he meant that completely seriously. In fact, in the 2000s, under a Republican administration, under George W. Bush, the United States had its biggest loss of manufacturing jobs in history because Asia was ready to take them over and American business and the American government were all ready to give them up. That had very bad consequences. If instead of shedding the manufacturing jobs, we had invested in newer kinds of manufacturing and retrained people, we would have lost some manufacturing jobs because of productivity and the automation. But we would have maintained so many communities, particularly in the upper Midwest, which were centered around manufacturing and which effectively dissolved because of the loss of manufacturing jobs. Now, we would need many different things. Asia subsidizes capital-intensive manufacturing. We subsidize sports stadiums. We'd have to go back to subsidizing it. Tax credits for R&D, tax credits for investment, and some direct subsidies of the kind we used to do in a big way with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Projects Research Agency, which helped build the digital age during the Reagan administration. We'd have to shift emphasis K through PhD to STEM, mathematics, and so forth. And I'm afraid we're going in the opposite direction. The Biden so-called infrastructure bill has tons of money for climate change and lots of money for historically black colleges to do R&D or what they're going to call R&D. But it proposes to raise corporate taxes, which will mean less R&D from the private sector. And the private sector not only does most of the R&D, private corporations produce 85% of the patents in the United States. So I see the Biden plan as negative in impact, not just insufficiently positive, but that negative. We have engineering departments which are now being run by diversity managers. 
instead of a meritocracy, we're going for diversity, inclusion, and equity, or die. I'm all for a more inclusive educational system, but you know, meritocracy is important. You want the best and most qualified engineer to build the car you're riding. Yeah, you could say in a very broad sense, the role of knowledge in our society has been completely warped. Part of what manufacturing meant and technology work in which anybody with a high school degree was involved at one point or another was that at every level of engineering, there is some knowledge. Everybody who is in the workforce is either in engineering or in some way aware of it, at least. And that means that knowledge has an importance to the society in general. And of course, at the top, it is not merely a matter of engineering. It's people who study the sciences, perhaps even in a theoretical way, since it is no mere matter of engineering to figure out something new, to invent new technologies, to leap forward. So there was a kind of connection between the elite and general population even in terms of work, because of their relationship to science and to knowledge. And it made for a certain respect for knowledge, which has been largely wiped out in public discourse. This is not to say wiped out in America, but it certainly means that the elites are rotten. As you suggest, yeah, they've climbed on to something that was built on claims of meritocracy, not that they were without fault or without trouble. But it seems like the worst crisis of American meritocracy was that people underestimated the extent to which the institutions of knowledge would self-destruct. And presumably a new push to restore science and technology and engineering to their necessary place in the American society and therefore the American economy would require institutions that are sturdier, perhaps because of this experience we are accumulating to our chagrin and bafflement that the institutions of knowledge are the most anti-rational, most hysterical, least interested in knowledge things you can imagine in American society. Yes, it reminds me of an old Jewish joke from Poland. Polish peasant says, there are people who say that four plus four equals eight. That I can accept. Others say that five plus three also equals eight. But that's a Jewish trick. You know, when you have people in mathematics education arguing that the belief that there is a unique answer to mathematical problems is an inherently racist, imperialist, misogynist point of view, we have really slid into psychosis. Now, even mathematics, now you can argue that religion has an element of personal choice and subjectivity, but not mathematics. I mean, it does have unique solutions. There's a superb economist, a Nobel laureate, teaches at Columbia named Edmund Phelps, who wrote a remarkable book a few years ago called Mass Flourishing. And his argument is that what makes for really extraordinary periods of economic growth is not scientific discoveries or entrepreneurs or government subsidies or education. It's the willingness of the whole population at every level of society to embrace innovation. That's a very, very great economist. He's been invited numerous times to China. He's met on several occasions with the premier, Liu He, who's also in charge of the Chinese economic program. Liu He endorsed his book. It's been translated into Chinese. It's a bestseller in Chinese. I don't believe it's sold very much in the United States. And I know for certain that Phelps was never invited to the White House to meet top officials. It is disturbing that this kind of embrace of knowledge and innovation and change at all levels of society that Phelps describes is more likely to be found in China than in the United States. And its apostle, Professor Phelps, is lionized in China and ignored in the United States. There isn't anyone who holds up the banner for science in the United States. In fact, if I were to put a name on the table, I think the only plausible answer is Elon Musk, who is also, strangely enough, a crazy guy and makes cars and rockets, which Americans used to be very proud of. It's not obvious to me that people are quite as proud of it anymore. But still, I think his celebrity suggests that science and making technological objects of some use and daring still might unite the nation. But there's not a lot around him. Yes, the lack of prominence among great scientists, lack of influence is certainly an important feature of this. For example, the reason President Reagan was so convinced that missile defense was something that should be pursued is because during the 1960s, when he was governor of California, he befriended Edward Teller one of the great physicists of the 20th century, one of the fathers of the atomic bomb and the father of the hydrogen bomb. 
who persuaded him that this was scientifically possible. Teller was sought after by the most prominent policymakers, politicians. David Rockefeller formed a trilateral commission and invited Teller to be its scientific advisor. Now, we had a generation of mainly European emigre scientists who were hugely influential in public policy and treated as celebrities. They were cultural heroes. It's very hard to think of a scientist today who has that kind of standing. And President Trump didn't even really have a science advisor. The White House Science Office was eventually occupied by a venture capitalist who had been Peter Thiel's chief operating officer, but not a scientist. I mean, there were a few good scientists in the Defense Department, but they really didn't have a lot of influence. And that's something which could only be remedied from the top. But if the Biden administration is more concerned about diversity, inclusion, and equity at engineering departments than about the quality of science, we're not going to get there. Yeah, you reminded me that Churchill had a great scientific advisor as well, the physicist Frederick Lindemann, yes. who was not prominent like Teller, but was uh, of great importance. And I think Absolutely. you're also right, that this is something that any intelligent observer of politics will judge politicians by or should. Does the politician have famous scientists who are of some use and have the public spiritedness required to do this? You're right that this has been wildly absent and wildly unnoticed. It does not portend well, but there is at least this much hope that since it is a problem that emerges at the top, it is also one that could be solved with different candidates, with people who offer a different vision of political elites. It would not hurt Republicans to think more seriously about learning from people like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, who are, if anything, obsessed with techno-scientific progress and incredibly skeptical of the fantasies that are peddled. You know, the California fantasies from Hollywood to Silicon Valley, they are selling America on fantasies and not on any kind of next generation progress. Let me add one other dimension to this, which is the Defense Department. One of our greatest defense secretaries was actually Jimmy Carter's defense secretary, Harold Brown, who had been the president of California Institute of Technology, one of our best uh, schools. He was a top level physicist. And under his guidance, uh, the Defense Department funded the projects which turned into mass production of fast and light computer chips, laser optics, visual displays. All the elements of the digital age came from either Harold Brown or his secretary, Jim Schlesinger, at the Defense Department. And the defense industry was continuously compelled to put its best people into the frontier of innovation. The Russians, in a sense, compelled us to do that. In the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, Russian surface-to-air missiles were then the new thing in military technology, and by themselves, they were able to wipe out anyone's advantage in aircraft. The Russians were pretty sure they would win a conventional war on the strength of the surface-to-air missiles. It was the digital technology, which was produced in the five or six years afterwards, mainly by Brown's Defense Department, that made it possible to defeat the Russian systems. And that kept the defense industry honest. In the last 15 years, we've done almost nothing of fundamental importance in defense technology. And the defense industry keeps selling us the same garbage year in, year out. Raytheon sells us the Patriot missile, which basically hasn't changed in 25 years. It's an obsolete, ineffective system. It's proved itself worthless in a number of situations, like the Iranian attacks on um, Saudi Arabia last year. But since there's no pressure to innovate from the top, the defense industry has become a fat and lazy monopoly. Uh, we no longer have flag officers. We have probationary lobbyists, you know, for Lockheed, Raytheon, and Boeing, and so forth. Yeah, these are all symptoms of political decadence. As you said before, one side of globalization is America going around the world, culturally, economically, catastrophically, militarily. But another side of globalization is all the world investing in America and therefore making possible this strange decadence, this strange bloat, not just in Washington, but in industry as well. One wonders how shocking the changes would have to be to make the Pentagon serious about innovation and therefore industry. To what extent you'd have to go to the private sector. There are some avenues of hope. The iPhone, in a sense, is a national catastrophe, making people both miserable and not particularly smart. But in another sense, it has built better processes than there were before. They're going to consume less energy. They have better design. And now ARM that makes them for Apple is going to get into servers and what have you. 
And so with the other players, we've realized that Intel is just not real competition anymore. And perhaps there's something you can get out of this. America has powered the Apple Corporation with this insane idea of buying these phones. But maybe there's something to get in return for all that money and investment. That's a very big deal. Can new politicians force corporate CEOs to take seriously innovation and cooperation with the government on defense issues? And perhaps the fundamental thing in all of these things, the reason we're talking about this in the first place is that the teacher of innovation is war. New technologies are created out of this terrible necessity. And America is learning again that war might be fought and not a kind of joking war where you can play around with terraforming the Middle East because nobody can fight back. Yes. But well, the kind of war where you're not even sure that you could defend Taiwan or anything of that kind. There are a whole set of technological issues relating to prospective war fighting. One is the introduction of hypervelocity glide missiles which travel at five to seven times the speed of sound and can follow a highly unpredictable path. So they're extremely hard to track and completely able to defeat any of the anti-missile defenses we have now. So it would certainly be an issue at the very frontier of physics to work out that kind of problem in missile defense. Tracking submarines underwater is another one. Controlling drone swarms involves non-trivial problems of both communication and computation. So to the extent that the United States had a program to attempt to defeat the new generation of weapons that we know China and Russia are developing, the implications of that could be extremely beneficial. Let me mention one anecdote uh, by way of closing. In 1983, I was working as a consultant at National Security Council during the Reagan administration. I worked for a man named Norman A. Bailey, who was a special assistant to the president for economics. And Bailey asked me to put together a memorandum on the civilian benefits of investment in strategic defense, strategic missile defense. And I did. And it was the worst piece of trash I ever wrote as an economist because I had absolutely no way to calculate it. I went back to earlier research on the economic spinoffs of NASA, which was also very bad research. But in fact, one sentence from my report made it into a Reagan speech. And the results of defense technology investment were an order of magnitude greater than anything I possibly could have imagined in all my attempt to put this in the most favorable possible light. So yes, I've seen the past and I hope it's the future. I've seen the past and it worked. Let's hope the future works too. All these things are possible. The Chinese aren't supermen, and it may not be the case that the majority of the Chinese people are interested in any kind of political experimentation now, but a very significant proportion of the Chinese elite are very dissatisfied with being ordered around by Communist Party bureaucrats. They don't like it. The kind of eccentric, individualistic, oddball thinker who's likely to make the greatest discoveries doesn't do particularly well in the Chinese system. So I believe that if we made an effort to organize a brain drain out of China of the most qualified and creative people, we could do ourselves an enormous amount of good and do the um, Chinese a certain amount of harm. Think of the movement of the Huguenot out of France after the uh, St. Bartholomew massacre and its effect on British industry. There are a lot of things. We're not down and out yet. and The Chinese are not supermen. But we're losing time and we're still going in the wrong direction. Indeed. I think this is the right note to close on. There is much that is sobering and that should sober us up. But there are also all these ideas and these possibilities of action that are gaining urgency and perhaps also gaining attention. To realize that things can be done, that political decisions and the vision for American security and technology is possible and urgently necessary, I think is the first task. And of course, I turn to you, first of all, to talk about these things. So thanks a lot for your time. That is a real pleasure to talk to you. I uh, hope we can continue the conversation sometime soon. Thanks a lot. Okay. Will, we will chat again. All the best. Okay. Very good, Tadis. Thank you. Look forward to our next talk.